just a real offering of praise. Amen. If you, if you would, would you please stand with me just one more time all over this house and those of you are online. We are in a series entitled The Creed, which is a study on the Apostles' Creed. And it's so important that we understand that our faith is not modern. Our faith is ancient. It's built on the foundation of those who have gone before us. The Bible even declares to us that we are surrounded about a great cloud of witnesses. So those who have gone on before us are not dead, they're alive, they're in Christ, and guess what? They're praying for your success. No matter what the devil throws against you, with God all things are possible. Come on, I mean really give the Lord an offering of praise, amen. So every Sunday before we get into the, the heart and the meat of this, this sermon, we, we confess the creed, and what we do is we join our faith with the universal church around the globe and also with the church that has gone before us. And what a great inheritance that we have as believers in the Lord Jesus, all right? So let's confess this. The Bible says that we confess with our mouth, we believe in our heart, we shall be saved. And I believe the creed is a snippet of all that's in the Word of God. So let's say it together, and let's join those of you online. You can join us at home, and um, let's, let's say it together real loudly with a little volume, all right? Are you ready? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. The judge, the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting, amen. All right, let's pray before you're seated. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you have created for us before the foundation of the world. It's not by accident who has joined us here in this room or who is joining us online. We pray for the next few minutes that you will anoint every heart, every thought, every mind, and Lord, my lips. Anoint us today so that we can shine with the glory of your Son who lives within us. We just bind every opposing spirit every thought that would try to come against the knowledge of God. We cast it down, and we proclaim victory today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody said together real loudly, amen. amen. You may be seated. Again, it's good to see everyone here. We thank you for joining us even online. Good to see our friend Oliver Thomas. We've been friends for a long time. He is a statesman, and we welcome him, and we pray for your success. We believe that it is, you need to be called by God to run for politics. That's all I'm going to say. Somebody says, your job is hard, Bishop. Well, I think the job of a politician is way harder. I'm glad I'm graced for what I do, and others are graced for what they do. But all of us have a purpose. All of us have a plan that's been given to us by God, and I think we need to run with it because that's where we'll find satisfaction and true success. We're in this, the middle of this, this series. It's actually the sixth sermon in the series. We've been dissecting the Apostles' Creed to, to just connect to our, our ancient, our ancient uh, inheritance, our, our heritage as believers. It goes deep. We know the book of Acts. We know the, the, the New Testament. But then there have been Christians who have lived for centuries and millennials and here we are today in 2020, how we need to know what we believe. The, the Bible says in the last days that many people 
will run to and fro and be carried about by every little wind of doctrine and just something new. But, but, but there's nothing new under the heavens. There's nothing new. There, everything that we know has already been written in this word and we study it, we walk with it, and we run with it, and it brings us into success that the Lord has already pre-planned for us. So today we want to talk about where we are in the Apostles' Creed and the phrase, he descended into hell on the third day and he arose again from the dead. I have two points, so you can shout hallelujah because that might mean that, that it's shorter today or it could just be that it's really long two points. So, uh, but here's what I always say, if you pray and you listen to me, I'll go short. If you don't listen to me and you look like you're not interested, we can just go on for days. But anyway, it's, it's your connection with the faith today. But I want to talk about two points, and again, he descended into hell. The first point is, hell is real. Psalms 139 verse 8 says this, this is the words of David, if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. How many are glad that God was with you, Jesus was with you at your lowest point? This is what David is saying, and all of us have had some low points, but the truth is, as I said last week, we find the Lord Jesus because he's in our suffering. He's there in our pain. You say, well, that's where everybody always finds him. No one here ever came to God when everything was going great. Everyone comes to the Lord when you're at your bottom. But guess what? Jesus suffered so that he can identify and you can identify with him. So thank God today, wherever we go, you cannot run from the Lord. If you run to California, thank God, I think he might be there. I don't know about California, but I, I, know, I know Louisiana, he's definitely here. I know he's in New Orleans. I know he's in the Ninth Ward. He's, he's in the Seventh Ward. I know he's from those of you from Chalmette, wherever you are, he's there. Wherever you go, he says he'll be there. But after Jesus dies, uh, the, the, we talk about the resurrection, we talk about the, 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 the crucifixion, but the, the fact is that there was a moment between Good Friday and the rising of Jesus on Sunday, what did Jesus do? Because we know he died. What took place? The Bible records that after Jesus died, and it was on the cross, that his body was buried in a tomb. But what did he do? The statement of the creed reminds us that Jesus did truly die, but that he went somewhere. Now, for today, the phrase, he descended into hell, is a controversial statement. It's probably the most controversial statement in all of the creed. As a matter of fact, people today, theologians, liberal theologians, want to delete this out of the creed. Because there is this mindset that a loving God would never send anyone to hell. Now, let me just make this statement real clearly. God never sends anything that's evil on anybody. Anything that's good that's happening in your world today it's all because of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. However, there was and is a place that was created for Lucifer, who is now Satan. It was considered hell, the place of the damned, and it was never created for human beings to go to. But the truth is, in Romans chapter 1, Paul tells us, that God speaks to everyone even through our existence on this planet. When you see the stars, the moon, when you see the mountains and the bayous and the beautiful world that we live in, when you look around, Paul tells us in Romans 1 that even creation speaks to us that there is a God. And the very fact that you hear the gospel today reminds you that God always gives us a place of redemption. So the truth is, God doesn't send anyone to hell. People choose to suppress their understanding that God exists. 
and they would rather their darkness than live in his light. Thank God today his grace has been revealed to you And today we come to church not to waste time because all of us could be doing a whole lot because you know this is football season. (laughs) We're not here because we're just checking it off on our to-do list. We are here today because there is a God. He sent his son. He delivers his people. And we are here to praise him and to thank him and to give him honor for how awesome he has been in our lives. There was a recent survey survey by Lifeway, and they they polled and they wanted to find out what people believe about hell. They found out that six out of 10 Americans say hell is a real place. Evangelical Protestants, 86% believe that hell is real. 66% of my Catholic brothers and sisters believe that hell is an actual place. Mainline Protestants, only 55% of those Christians actually believe hell is a real place. Overall, Americans don't seem to be too worried about hell because they believe that most people, 67% say most people are basically good. The truth is, no one's good not even one. There's only been one good. There's only been one who is awesome. His name is Jesus. Say that name out loud today. Say Jesus. But the Bible tells us that Jesus descended into hell and it's it's the temporary place of the dead. And I'll explain that to you. But it is a physical place. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8 Let me show you what what, what Paul says here in this particular scripture. He says, therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, so what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Now the English here is misleading the word hell. Actually, the word hell is referring to the temporary place of the dead for those who are awaiting judgment. Let me just break it down like this. In the Old Testament, the word hell was referred to Sheol, which was, which was the Old Testament of re- referring to the place or a temporary place of those who are awaiting judgment. In the New Testament, in the Greek, Hades is the word that actually should be used here. Remember, and I'll show, I'll read it to you in a a few minutes, Abraham's bosom, a place of both torment and blessing, as seen with Lazarus and the rich man. The actual word for the lake of fire or the second death or ultimate place of hell is Gehenna. It's the final place of retribution for the godless or you old time Pentecostals, the lake of fire. When your mama used to say, you know where all liars go? They go to the lake of fire. But the truth is, is that when Jesus went into hell, as the scriptures and the creed refers to, he actually went to a place, the New Testament, that's referred to as Hades. So on the day of of silence, or Holy Saturday, Jesus went into the place of hell and he did three things. The first thing he did was that he turned Hades into paradise. Jesus said on the cross, if you remember, he spoke to, there had two people hanging on, one on each side. And the thief looked at Jesus and said, remember me when you go into this next afterlife. And Jesus referred to this in Luke 23 verse 43. He said to him, surely I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. So what Jesus did was that he hung on the cross, he was put in a tomb, physical tomb, and in that tomb on that Saturday between Friday and Sunday, Jesus took a visit down to Hades, Sheol, paradise, which is where Lazarus 
and Abraham's bosom, Jesus went there and he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and he turned Hades into paradise. Now that's very important because the scripture tells us that before this event took place, even those Old Testament saints were in a place of waiting until the resurrection and the movement of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit to liberate them into paradise. So Jesus, in all of what he did, he redeemed us for our forgiveness of sins, but he also took a visit down into what we know as Sheol or Hades, and he said, you know what? This is gonna be a different place from now on. This is going to be paradise instead of torment. Thank God, the scripture reminds us too, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse six, so we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yet well pleased, whether to be absent from the body now, this is Paul, after Jesus went to the cross, to hell, now to be absent from this body, we are not in a holding pattern waiting for something to take place, to be absent from this body, to experience death here on this earth, you are instantly now into the presence of the Lord. What a powerful, mighty God our Lord Jesus is today. Revelation chapter one, verse 18 says, for I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive. I have the keys of Hades and death. So thank God today we have hope in the future that this life, thank God for this life, but this life runs real fast, it goes quickly, but thanks be to God today in Jesus Christ, he holds the keys to death and hell, and so if we are finished on this earth, it is then we are immediately, not in a holding pattern, not waiting for something to take place, we are immediately, Dr. Benson, in the presence of the Lord. I think that the Lord did a mighty, mighty work. Come on, give him praise today. <laughs> Secondly, he perfected the spirits of the Old Testament believers. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 40, 23 says this, to the general assembly in the church of the firstborn who were registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now, what happened to the believers of the Old Testament before they were, there was a resurrection. What did people like Noah, when they died, where did they go? They went to a place of Sheol. There was a great divide. We know that on one side, there was a side that was, who, who died in righteousness and those who died in, in an ungodly status. They were there in that same place, but there was a gulf between them. When Jesus went to, the, to, to hell, he separated and he took them along with him. Now, listen to this. I want, you to hold, I want you to hear me now. Jesus then, when he went there and he preached, he preached to the Old Testament believers because they had not experienced, like you and I have today, this resurrection power that lives inside of us. They died with a hope that Jesus the Messiah would come. But when Jesus arrived, can you imagine having lived your life for God and now you're in a place where you're waiting on this place or this moment to, to take place. Jesus arrives and he speaks the word of heaven in hell. I mean, he split hell wide open. And it wasn't no big fight. This was no, this was no, uh, no, no heavyweight boxing match. When Jesus showed up, every demon scattered. Everything that was darkness turned into light. And what did he do? Jesus took the keys, the death and Hades, and he took the Old Testament 
believers with him, and he brought them into the presence of paradise. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that many of the Old Testament believers who were waiting in Sheol or waiting in Hades, they were delivered, they met up with their bodies on the earth, and they began to walk around Jerusalem for a few days. Can you imagine how crazy that had been? Some of your loved ones who had gone on, they show up in their body, and they walk in your room, and you're like, what the hell is happening here? Ladies and gentlemen, the resurrection is not some fictional story. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is working and living within the church. Death can't hold you. Sickness, opposition can't hold you. If God and Jesus be for you, who can be against you? Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Satan, where is your power? In the name of Jesus, every devil is defeated. Somebody give God some praise today. I want to show it to you in the scripture. Don't take my word for it. Matthew 27, verse 52, it says, and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after the resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared not to a few, but to many. Can you imagine? Now, that was just a foretaste of what it's going to be when Jesus comes the second time and the graves are split wide open and all of the believers who died in Christ come alive. Can you imagine the scare we're going to give this world when the people of God that have gone on come out of their place of sleeping and slumber? Some of us have recently lost some family members, but if they prayed and they were in the presence of the Lord, it is not over. There will be a great reckoning day. There will be a great homecoming day. You talk about a family reunion? You ain't seen nothing yet. There's going to be all kind of food going on. There's going to be ribs. There's going to be chicken. There's going to be steak. There's going to be some greens. You talk about having a whole show, a show up and a show out, this is going to be it. That's the day we know as the great resurrection. But this was a foretaste. So when Jesus went into hell, he said all to the the Old Testament believers, come, let's go. And they were resurrected. Now they're in the presence of Almighty God. Praise the Lord today. But not only that, he did a third thing, Dr. Benson. The Bible said that he proclaimed the gospel to the rebellious spirits. Now to me, this shows me how great and how merciful and how gracious our God really is. He is a God of mercy. He's a God that today if you have wandered off and made some mistakes and missed it, he's the God of a second chance. As a matter of fact, let me just say it this way. He's not just the God of a second chance. In my book, he's been the God of a third chance. He's been the God of a fourth chance. And and, and, and Mr. Avis, he's been the God of a hundred chances for you. I I just couldn't pass that up. What I'm saying is somebody ought to be excited today because if it had not been for the redemptive, merciful hand of the Lord, where would, come on somebody, where would you be? That's why you can't walk around with an unforgiven heart. If God forgave you a hundred times, can't you forgive somebody at least two times? Get over it. Somebody go to Lowe's, get 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 you a ladder, get over it. Because he's already forgiven you. He's already forgiven you for what you will do if you call upon the name of the Lord. Somebody give him a shout of praise today. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19 says this, by whom also he went 
and he preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient. When once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. I could go on all day on that scripture. Water always saves you. You can't get saved unless you go to the baptism, waters of baptism. Some people try to avoid it. Well, you're avoiding God. You got to go through water. Everybody who's ever been saved had to go through water. As a matter of fact, you couldn't even come into this world until you went through your mama's water. I could tell you a whole lot of stories about our four. The first time the water broke, we didn't know what it was. We thought we were having a, a mishap in the, in the bathroom. I mean, when you're 20 and 20 and 30, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't really know these things. You're a little, when you get a little older, you, re, you know. But the point was, everybody who's ever been birthed into anything goes through water. That's just another sermon for another day, but I would really like to jump on it, but I'm not. But there were fallen angels. Remember when there was a rebellion that broke out in heaven? They only got one chance. Now, I just talked about we get two and three and four. But the angels of old, they didn't get a second chance. When they rebelled against God, God said, you know what? Done. See ya. Bye. Jesus even said that he saw Lucifer fall like lightning. That's why the earth is the place where there is great, great interaction and conflict. The earth is the place where Lucifer fell when God kicked him out of heaven. And God put Adam and Eve in this place to create a new order. But we know that Adam and Eve missed it, but Jesus, the second Adam, did not. Thank God for that. But Jesus on Saturday, because that's Friday and Sunday, on Saturday, he took a visit to hell. And he went to all of those Old Testament believers and the angels that had rebelled against the ways of God. There were also there in that, in that, in that, in that place were the Nephilims, those that had mixed with men and women or angels and women and there was a supernatural race. That's why we have this history of giants that are left over from Hebrews, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter six and seven and eight. And you'll find there that they, what's what mytho Greek mythology is they referred to as these great heroes of the past. Those fallen angels, those Nephilims, those, those, those mixture hybrids of spirits and humanity, Jesus went to hell and he preached to them another moment of redemption. Now the truth is, some believed the Lord, but there are still some that did not believe the Lord. Even when Jesus, now what can you imagine? Forget me preaching. If Jesus was here this morning and he was just preaching himself, you probably wouldn't listen to him because Jesus didn't look like what you thought he should look like. So there's Jesus preaching to the spirits in hell and some the scriptures refer to remind us that there is no redemption, there is no, no outlet because they don't believe what the Lord was saying for him. I might need another mic, huh? I do have a loud voice, but the problem is the people online won't hear me as well. <laughs> Thank you. Testing one, two. One, two. Give me a little volume. Thank you, Jesus. Now I'm truly Pentecostal. When I get a mic in my hand, if I start screaming, you blame it on the fallen mic. 
But can you imagine Jesus coming into hell, giving people, giving humanity, fallen spirits, a second chance, and they still don't respond in repentance. Even the scripture that Jesus refers to as Lazarus and, and the, 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 poor, the, the rich man. He was crying out, Lord, send, my, send an angel to tell my brothers and sisters that hell is real. And Jesus said if they don't believe the law of Moses and the prophets and the words that are being spoken even today, they will not believe even though one would come from hell to preach to them. The question today is we can listen to all of what took place, but the answer that must be, the question must be answered, do you believe that hell is a real place? Because hell is not a place that God created for you. It was created for Lucifer and those who would rebel. But it is an opportunity today for us to understand that even though that is a real place, there is a chance for God to grant us his escape. Now, before I move on to the second point, let me just make this disclaimer. Jesus did that once and for all. He is not going back to hell to preach again. He's not going to do what he did once and for all. What we have to understand is that while we're living on this planet, he gives us many opportunities like even today to say, I know that that place is real, but that's not where I want to go. I want the Lord Jesus because he will make a way for me even in the wilderness. So the second thing is, on the third day he arose again from the dead. The second point is the resurrection is real. Hell is real, but the resurrection is real. What if Jesus had not risen from the grave like Muhammad? or Gandhi, or Socrates, or Aristotle? Would Jesus' message still be as powerful? Maybe so, because even Gandhi said, the words of Jesus are so profound, the problem I have is not with Jesus, it's with the followers of Jesus. Now that's great, it sounds good, Gandhi, but the truth is, it doesn't matter how great we obey, the fact is, Jesus is Lord simply because he was the only one worthy and the only one who was born with a nature that could obey the rules and the commandments and the ordinances of God. So what if Jesus had not? What would it be? We would still be in our sin. We would still be in a place of no hope of rising from the dead. I want to read this verse of scripture in Luke chapter 24. I want you to just turn it with me if you would. Luke 24 and, and, and verse 1 because it truly gives us an indication of what took place on that day. Real quickly, it says this. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and the certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices for which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus, and it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, the two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he's risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And then they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. 
It was Mary Magdalene, Johanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But when Peter arose and ran to the tomb, stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. They didn't believe the women, but they finally believed Brother Peter. Thank God for girl people. It was girl people who first ran to the tomb to see what had taken place. The first prophets in the New Testament were not men. This is why I always have a problem with guys who don't know the scripture. Women, thank you ladies. (laughs) Women always get it first. I thought y'all would love me on that one. Guys, the reason why you can't get it first is because you're working with only half of your brain. (laughs) Girls, your brain functions on both sides. So when a guy tells you, I can't remember, he's not lying. (laughs) He can't remember. My wife will tell me things. Remember in 1996 when you were wearing red and you looked at me like, I'm like, I don't even remember what I drank yesterday. And you're going to tell me about something that I did and I looked at you cross-eyed in 1996? And my reply is, I only have half a brain. (laughs) The truth is, you do your research, women, their synapse works on both sides. The guys, we're just kind of crippled. But the point is, (laughs) women ran to the grave first. Women always get it first. Women, God puts you in the church to pray that we would get it. (laughs) That's just a little sidebar but it'll help you out. But the truth is, if Jesus had not risen, we would have no fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That day of suffering, we know that Jesus rose from the grave. They tried to bring a conspiracy that the body of Jesus had been stolen from the disciples. The fact is, after a month or two of trying to discover the body of Jesus, not believing, that Jesus had actually physically been raised from the dead. The conspiracy was that Jesus never did really die, that he actually was hiding out in Arabia. And then there were those who were saying, Jesus died, but his disciples took his body and they disposed of it somewhere in a swamp or somewhere where no one could find him. The truth is, we know, as we just read, Jesus His body's not there. I've been there twice in Jerusalem, and I've looked in the tomb myself, and I can verify he ain't there. Why? Because Jesus is alive, physically in his body. But the ancient church, they thought of death a little different than you and I do. See, we think of death as something that is final. The early church, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they actually celebrated and loved when folks finished their course here and went on into eternity. We today, and I believe that we ought to protect ourselves, and I believe that we ought to live with wisdom because we all want to live a long life here. But the truth is, is that we're not going to live forever here. When we make a decision to live in Christ, we decide where we will spend our eternity. But the early church, they believed in death in Christ in such a way that believers would assemble in tombs for prayer. 
Now, people would think that we are weird, especially on Halloween. If we all said today, let's meet tonight for prayer in St. Louis, number one, because we're going to have intercessory prayer for the city of New Orleans. You would say, they need to do another story on Bishop. (laughs) This man has lost his mind. I ain't going to no tomb. But the truth is, the early church would pray amongst the tombs. As a matter of fact, they would worship among the bones. They would gaze upon the bodies of the dead and sing praises. I think that's where we get jazz funerals from. Instead of mourning, they would rejoice because they believed that to be absent, to be absent from the body is to be actually in the presence of Jesus. <laughs> somebody, somebody, somebody ought to praise God. Christians actually place the dead at the center of their public gatherings. Earliest church buildings were really big mausoleums erected over the remains of martyrs. John Chrysostom, who was the silver golden tongue of the fourth century, said, tombs with life, tombs that give voice. I've been to those tombs, the ancient catacombs in Rome, and I've gone down to four or five different levels in the ground, and I've seen where there are prayer rooms that were carved out because they really believed that to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord. And then we'll talk about this later on, that the communion of the saints was not just getting together with all you folks, but that when we actually got together, two or three, that Jesus would be there. Now don't get me wrong, just listen, just hold on. That everybody that had gone on before them was actually present. Like I said, where do you get that in Scripture? We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. My mother's going on to be with the Lord, and I'm not speaking spiritualism. I'm just saying there are times that I know that my mama's prayers are being heard. There may be some people that are praying against me, but I know There are people who are praying for me, and it's not just those who are present in this room, but it's those who have gone on before. They're saying even right now, preach it, son. Preach it like I raised you to preach. Talk like I raised you to talk. Tell the people that Jesus is real, and if you put your hope, your faith in the Lord, you shall be saved. Somebody. Give him some praise. He's risen. What does that mean? He proves he's the son of God. He's risen. That means he has victory over death. That means he has given us forgiveness. And then our future, our future resurrection. Death has lost its sting. Death is no longer the ultimate power in this world. The martyrs are proof that death has no power over the believer. In death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, death itself was altered. One of my favorite theologians of the old, Athanasius, said this, we no longer die as those condemned but as those who will arise. The Christian mystery is this. By nature, we are all on the way from birth to death. 
you cannot escape it. But by grace, we are traveling in the opposite direction. Now, let me just help you out, Elder Pam Porter. Anybody ever seen Benjamin Button? You know, the movie, Benjamin Button, Brad Pitt. I think it was filmed here in New Orleans. He was a man that was born old, and his progression of growing older was that he actually became younger. He was so young to be so old. In Christ, we are like Benjamin Button. We were born to grow older, but in baptism, we experienced death. So as we progress in our age, we're actually growing younger. This is why you still want to throw a football at 60 years old, but then the next day, you wake up and you make an appointment to see your chiropractor. That's called a fleshly body, but your spirit and your soul will one day connect with your heavenly body, which you will remain at the age of 33 forever. Why? The Bible says we don't know what Christ will look like, but we do know we will see him and be as he is. When Christ died, he died at 33. Today, if you were to come across Jesus and he would appear to you, he would still look the same age as 33. He continues to grow old, but he remains young. Hello, Benjamin Button. (laughs) Here's the point. The Christian life is a mystery that moves us from death to birth. At the beginning, we are baptized in Christ's death. And at the end, we are born into the life of the resurrection. We are born as though dying, but we die as those who are being born. 1 Corinthians 15, the last scripture. 55, Paul says, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? So the creed declares he descended into hell. There was a reason. But then he arose on the third day. Why? Because now, because he's alive, we can be alive if we utter the first two words of the creed, I believe. Every religion in the world demands you do something to receive salvation. Only Christianity declares that if we confess we shall be saved. Muslims, do good works and you may go to heaven. Jesus, receive me, thief on the cross. Believe in me and I will see you today in paradise. The question today, do you believe? He descended, but thank God, he arose on the third day. Come on, stand with me in this house. He arose on the third day. If Jesus had not risen, he would be as the same as Muhammad, Confucius. He would be the same as all the great philosophers that we all learn about in college. Aristotle, Socrates, all of those great minds, great people, yet they were no Jesus. 
Jesus split Hades wide open. And then he arose from the grave on the third day. So what do I need to do, Bishop? Since you say hell is a real place, what do I do? You say that Jesus arose on the third day. Do I need to join the church? Well, that's a good thing. Uh, do, I, do, I, do I need to help little old ladies across the, the, the street? That's a good thing. Should I give to someone who's begging on the, on the sidewalk for some money? That's a good thing. But all those things will not reserve you a place in heaven. Those are things that we should do. We should love one another. We should care for one another. The only way that you can reserve your ticket, your place in heaven and not in the default setting of hell is to say, I believe. I want him in my life. It doesn't matter what your background may be, if it's Catholic, Protestant, Pentecostal, or like some of us, heathen. It doesn't matter. All have sinned. All of us have come short of the glory of God. But I've got some good news. Jesus rose. He rose from the grave. And he's calling and knocking on your heart today. Have you made your reservations? Or could I say, are you ready? Are you ready? No one knows the day. No one knows the hour. No one knows what's going to happen from here even to on your way home. But the good news is, if I put my hope and my trust in the Lord, I shall be saved. Every head bowed, every eye closed real quickly. You say, Bishop, today I want to make sure, I want to make sure that I'm right. I believe that heaven's a real place. I believe hell's a real place. But I also believe that Jesus died and rose again. I'm asking you, Lord, to change me and to make me ready. There are a number. I prayed about this even last night. I stayed up late. And God spoke to me and said, there will be people today that need to make a decision to say yes to Jesus. Yes to the Lord. I'm not taking members in the church. It's about you being ready. If that's you today, I just want you to simply just, just, just lift your hand real quickly. I want to pray with you. Come on. Right now, in Jesus' name, say, Bishop, I want to make sure right now, God bless you. God bless you. There are others, yes. There are other people, yes. God bless you. I want you to just keep your hand raised and you say today, Lord, I, I need Jesus in my life. And there are people today that raised their hand and said, you know what? I want to make it right. I want to go. I want to be in heaven. And I'm going to ask you to just do one more thing right where you are. I want you to say this simple prayer. I'm going to lead you in this prayer. It's a prayer of confession. It's a it's, it's a prayer that says, Lord, I want you to come in and I want you to say this, this prayer with me right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe today. Come on, say it out loud. Say, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you went to the cross, you died, but you rose again. For my salvation, I ask you now, Lord, to come into my life. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. And give me a brand new future. I receive you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God an offer of praise. Come on. Now, Rick, real quickly, I just want to do one more thing. I'm going to ask the pastors to come. There are people who want prayer today. Those, those who are suffering in your body. There are those who are going through difficult times. Everybody needs prayer. I need prayer. I'm going to ask you real quickly, 
you need someone to pray with you. These men and women will pray with you. I want you to get out of your seat and come real quickly. They're gonna pray with you and God's gonna meet you. And we're gonna worship just a few minutes, it's not gonna take long, but I'm asking you to come. You say, I need prayer. I want the Lord to touch my life today. Maybe it's sickness, maybe it's, maybe it's some kind of financial burden or whatever. But today, we wanna to pray with you and let God meet you today. You are.